Namo tassa bhagavato arahato samma sambuddhasa Namo tassa bhagavato arahato samma sambuddhasa Namo tassa bhagavato arahato samma sambuddhasa Buddhang dhammang sanggang namasami So who here has heard of the word papancha? Oh, good. Okay, we're somewhat versed in this term. Many of you will know the usual translation of papancha as proliferation. And I realized several weeks ago that it's not actually a term that I'd spoken to yet, and yet it forms such a core part of most of our lives. So for those who aren't familiar, the term papancha is one the Buddha used to talk about conceptual proliferation, uh, although Ajahn Jeff translates it as objectification. And it's the process wherein after conceiving of a fixed self through which we, by which we, perceive experience, we move into vast storylines and our minds run off without us, basically. It's how many of us spend a great deal of our meditation time and life. And so it's a very useful term to understand. And I think one of the best and most pithy suttas where the Buddha speaks to the origins of papancha, conceptual proliferation, is the Madhupindaka Sutta, which is the Honeyball Sutta. And in it he says, based on sight and forms, eye consciousness arises. The meeting of the three is contact. With contact as a condition, there is feeling. What one feels, one perceives. What one perceives, one thinks about. What one thinks about, one proliferates. Based on one's proliferation, the categories of proliferation with regard to future and past contact with the eye assail one. So there's a lot to unpack there. Basically, the moment of contact is a common philosophical starting point in the Buddhist conception of how we come into experience is we move through any one of the six sense spaces, eye, ear, tongue, nose, mouth, tactile sensation, or the mind. And we come into contact with an external form, in the case of the eye. There's consciousness of the object, and the meeting of those three is contact. That's the real starting point. Because when it's just the eye or the external form, it's not enough. There's also got to be consciousness of the object. Most of what we see every day, we aren't really conscious of. Uh, we fixate on very small portions of our visual field. I think the amount of visual space in the landscape of what we see that is of any... Uh, high resolution is extremely small. Most of what we perceive is, is quite fuzzy, but we fixate on very particular parts of our visual experience. And so there has to be consciousness uh, of a visual object for it to really serve as the basis for this whole process of proliferation. But once there is that consciousness and visual contact, 
then one feels. And in Buddhism, feeling is not emotion so much as the idea of the Pali's Vedana. It's a feeling tone. That is to say, unpleasant, pleasant, or neutral. And this is so basic to our uh, cognitive process. It, it's almost, in the Buddhist conception, it is often before perception, although there's a feedback loop. So we see someone that we have had deep problems with in the past. And even before, say, we've thought of their name, even before their history has come up, been dredged up from our memory, there's initially the prickliness or the nausea in the stomach. The feeling proceeds and adds valence to everything that follows. So with contact as a, percept, uh, as a condition, there is feeling. What one feels, one perceives. Based on that feeling uh, and conditioned by it, we have perceptions, and that's what we label with the mind. Uh, f uh, perceptions are how we crystallize a uh, category for a person or a place. So uh, lover, friend, enemy, it's the mental label we apply. And it has a hugely crystallizing effect of self and other. Very often perception is framed in terms of self and other. And when uh, teachers compare the different mental faculties to the different fingers, perception is often the ring finger because it's what marries you to a way of relating to someone. Are they your enemy? Are they your friend? And it's therefore very important to become quite conscious of our perceptions and to challenge them at time and to use them skillfully. And it's important to see here that up until that step in the sutta, all of the process has been framed in impersonal language. With the arising of I and forms, there is consciousness. The meeting of the three is contact. With contact as a condition, there is feeling. And then the pronoun enters. What one feels, one perceives. So the sense of self enters with perception. This is really where things start to rev up and we get involved. And what one perceives, one thinks about. And then what one thinks about, one proliferates. And then the real, uh, the real cherry on top is based on that proliferation, proliferation about future contact assails one. Our own creations turn on us and devour us and torment us. And this is much of our lives. There's so much in the sutta. What one perceives, one thinks about. What one thinks about, one proliferates. One's proliferations assail one. So who has felt assailed by their proliferations in the past? Yes. <laughs> Good. So I think... Uh, Never mind. Ajahn Jeff has an interesting metaphor about this, these proliferations as chickens that you feed uh, and then they come and peck at you at night. I think he calls them like man-eating chickens or something. It's a very clickbaity title. It was a good one. <laughs> um, and so this idea of proliferation, what we create gaining momentum until it turns on us, these Frankensteins, uh, which are these programs with their own momentum. And how do we learn to hamstring that process? The Buddha has another sutta where that's quite illuminating about the origin of these proliferative processes. It's called the Tuataka Sutta. And a Brahmin, I think, or another mendicant comes to the Buddha and says, I ask the seer, the kinsman of the sun, which was uh, a word that the Buddha used or was uh, addressed to him. What, how is one freed from suffering and achieving and achieves the state of peace? And the Buddha says, one should put an end to the starting point of all proliferations. That is the thought, I am the thinker. So as soon as we have this perception 
self-reflexive thought of me and other. It creates the ground for so much suffering and unnecessary thought. This is the starting point. And from there, we're off to the races. So it, it's really useful to see that this is why so many of the ways the Buddha told us to apply right attention, so many of the Buddhist frameworks are not, they don't feature the idea of self. The Four Noble Truths, you're looking at experience as stress, the origin of stress, the cessation of stress, peace, and the path. There's no self in those. Um, looking at things in terms of the six sense bases, uh, the five aggregates of body, feeling, perception, uh, mental formations, consciousness, these different focal points of identity, but it's ways of breaking down experience into refined slices of the pie, so to speak, rather than just taking one big pie of self and kind of smashing yourself in the face repeatedly, which is where most of us are. And I think the Buddha, his brilliance is really laying out this process in detail. In the second discourse in the Majjhima the Mula Pariyaya, uh, sorry, the Sabhasava Sutta, he says, one attends inappropriately to experience by thinking, was I in the past? What was I in the past? Was I not in the past? How was I in the past? Having been what, what will I become in the past? Or one thinks, will I be in the future? Will I not be in the future? How will I be in the future? What will I be in the future? Having been what, what will I become in the future? Or one is inwardly perplexed about the present, thinking, am I? Am I not? How am I? What am I? Having been what, what will I become? So he pretty much nails all of most of 90% of our thinking right there in a fell swoop and, uh, and says, based on these thoughts, one of several views arises in one. One has the view, I exist. One is the view, I do not exist. One is the view, uh, it is through not self that I perceive self. It is through self that I perceive not self. And it goes on through pretty much every proliferation of Western philosophy over the last 2,500 years. And the Buddha says, these are all inappropriate ways of attending to experience. These are all prapancha. When one attends correctly to experience, one attends thinking, this is suffering. This is the cause of suffering. This is peace, the cessation of suffering. And this is the path to peace. Those four. Everything else, he says, and this is a phrase worth memorizing, is a thicket of views, a writhing of views, a contortion of views. Trapped by a contortion of views, one does not come to the end of stress. So, seeing how we begin with a thought of self and quickly that solidifies into self and other, and quickly we become afraid for that self and proliferate into the future about what might happen or what has happened and remorse or regret or resentment. All these are proliferations that turn on us and are at their most fundamental based on a delusion. They stand on nothing. And when the Buddha speaks of how to hamstring them, often it's as simple as just applying the Four Noble Truths and saying, oh, this is suffering. And really that is often enough. Can you find yourself in the midst of running through that old argument again and just saying, oh, this is dukkha? Or if you find yourself debating whether you'll have the donut tomorrow morning or not, should you, shouldn't you, can you just say, oh, that's, that's suffering, dukkha, and watch the whole thing dissolve. Stress, dukkha, can be deep suffering, but it can also just be the sense of subtly hovering over an object, of not being able to settle. It's the lack of peace. 
And sometimes simply applying the Four Noble Truths bring you back, brings you back to solid ground. This is the solid ground the Buddha gave us. He says that all things converge on feeling, dukkha. And we had someone recently ask about how they make friends with their anger. And it's a tall order to make friends with one's anger. One can learn to accept that as a part of one. We are far angrier than we admit. And one enormous footstep on practice is realizing how much anger we hold in us. We are half God, half animal, and realizing this animal primal quality and just accepting that that's, that's part of us too. But to really get to the heart of it, one traces back further to the dukkha below that. Because behind anger is simply disguised vulnerability. And when you really think of the situation, how long have we tried to make life fit together, to make all the pieces work, and it just won't? Samsara, life is not a little broken. It's it's really broken, and it just won't quite fit. Many of you know the definition of dukkha as the axle that's slightly off. Du means uh, wrong. Ka means the whole of an axle. It's the wheel that's always a little bit wiggly. And how could we not be frustrated when all we want is security and peace, and we cannot get it, and we've tried for ages? So a huge part of practice is realizing this deep anger. And that's one step. But the step beyond that is tracing that back to the vulnerable child below the anger, the dukkha below the anger. All things converge on feeling. That's the root. And that's also one more way to hamstring papancha, because the anger and the resentment and the frustration are one form of proliferation. It's an unnecessary add-on. And if you just trace back to the vulnerability and the dukkha and the Four Noble Truths below the anger, below the frustration, below the self-recrimination, you hamstring the whole process of proliferation and anger. And that vulnerable self is something you can become friends with. That is something you can sit down at the dinner table and really care for and feel tenderness for. So this is a way of hamstringing all that. It's why the Buddha held out dukkha so prominently is because it was, it's what binds us and it's the doorway to grace. Other really useful ways of stopping a pancha, hamstringing it. First, one can do what Ajahn Amaro calls tracing back the radiance, which is when you find yourself five minutes out on a fantasy about penguins in Antarctica, something crazy where you've been meditating and you just, you don't know how you got where you are, but there you are. See if you can walk yourself back through the steps that got you there, thought by thought by thought, and find yourself, usually you'll come back to some small impression, hearing a bird outside, and that kind of sounds like the bird at your grandmother's house, and your grandmother and you never really solved that argument you had over your brother, right? But your brother was kind of a jerk, and really you should call him, it's been a while, but, uh, you know, etc. So... Trace back, trace the radiance back to the initial spark. And if you do that repeatedly, you do become much more suspicious and aware of those movements of the mind. Another is, this resonates well with a, a Buddha Sutta where he said that one can have three kinds of mind. One can have a mind like stone which is where one is easily angered and the anger lasts a long time, like letters carved on stone. One can have a mind like sand. One is easily angered, but it fades quickly, like letters 
drawn in sand, would be blown quickly away by the wind. Or one can have a mind like water, where any impression fades immediately, and one is not angered. And this is a technique Ajahn Jayasaro gives, where if you find yourself in the middle of a repeated proliferation or a thought, imagine writing the words on water. Instead of thinking the words out loud, write them on water and watch them dissolve and watch the mind just let go. Another is if you find yourself caught in a feedback loop of repeated uh, a certain phrase, like, I would really like a cup of coffee, just repeat that last part of the phrase again and again until it loses its meaning. A cup of coffee, a cup of coffee, a cup of coffee, a cup of coffee and see how quickly it becomes utterly, it loses all of its valence. Sometimes you can't stop a thought right away, but you can just put it on that weird cycle until it dissolves of its own accord. The other is to attach a Dharma reflection to the end of a sentence. So if you find yourself in a repeated proliferation, um, you know, I'd really like to, how could they possibly do that? And then just tag on, and that's anicca, or and that's dukkha, or and that's anatta, that's impermanent, that's suffering, that's not self. Whatever phrase kind of works for you, rather than trying to cut the thought off, just tag on that bit of dharma at the end to every sentence you're formulating in your mind, and watch how that lets things fade quite, quite quickly. But one of the most important ways to approach this is in meditation by making sure one has a interesting meditation object. We had someone during uh, Wednesday's session ask, how do I catch this process of proliferation earlier? And it's useful noting that the mind will search for distraction if it's bored. And if meditation becomes a rote practice in using the will and just the will to bring yourself back to a simple and perhaps uninteresting meditation object time and again, when the mind is used to far more uh, stimulating fodder, like Netflix or whatever, then it will search for something more interesting. And so we need to work with that impulse and make your meditation interesting and engaging. Meditation should be playful. It should be fun. And to do that, you need to bring to bear tools on it. So instead of just having one meditation object, I often recommend approaching meditation as a meal. So you have your rice and you have your curry. I don't know of a good Western equivalent, maybe like your sandwich and your, your soup. It's not as good. <laughs> so have your staple of your rice. And often this will be the breath for many people, um, maybe a mantra, uh, but something quite stable. But then also have a curry, a bright, sort of spacious object. Metta, loving kindness, is a really good curry for most people. Uh, the nada sound, the sound of silence, which I just sort of pointed to, is really good for people. And if you haven't tried to touch into the nada sound, the sound of silence, I really recommend cultivating it or at least exploring it. It's an unbelievably powerful object. If you give attention to it over weeks and months, it be can become an ever-present whisper in a really beautiful way. It brightens the mind. It's the auditory equivalent of the perception of light. And uh, Ajahn Amaro can hear it over power tools. It's there all the time. So. If you have two meditation objects, then when the breath is boring to you or has lost its interest, then you foreground loving kindness. And it can be quite active. You can bring to mind people you care for, the squirrel you find cute outside, a phrase. Um, and then once you've sort of used the mind's energy on that and the mind has lost interest, it might circle back to the breath. And so you foreground the breath and background the, uh, the loving kindness and just keep this gentle sense of friendliness in the back. And having a tool belt of meditative objects like that to cycle between keeps engagement. You can mix together recipes. 
And similarly, uh, the Buddha spoke about different mental activities or types of mental activity, or it's not just mental, types of activity internal to your experience. There's bodily, verbal, and mental. So for every meditative object, there's these kind of three ingredients you can mix in. So verbal is the phrase you repeat to yourself. Mental, chitta sankara, is a perception or an image. And kaya sankara, bodily activity, is the sense in the body. So for metta, the curry, you have three ingredients. You have the sort of sense of warmth in the heart. That's the kaya sankara, the bodily activity. You have the metta phrase, may I be free from suffering, may I be free from fear. And then you have the mental phrase, uh, sorry, that's the verbal activity, the phrase. And then you have the mental activity, which is the perception, the image of the person you love. And any of these three ingredients are, are fine. Just use the one that feels the most powerful and resonant to you. So all to say that like, there's a lot of cooking you can do in here. If you're going to proliferate, do it in an interesting way and use the mind's energy to mix, mix together a really good dish of meditation. What works for you? Don't overcomplicate things, but if you're getting bored and the mind is repeatedly going off into the past and future, then see if you can try to make a new dish. And if you find your meditation object is getting really dull, there can be this subtle narrative in a lot of meditative circles of just like keep on, keep on at it, and one of these days you'll just click and it'll all pop. And it's true to some extent, things do come together at times. But I don't trust that narrative. Meditation should be playful and interesting and engaging, and you should be working with these objects. So if meditation is getting dull over a long period and dry, one really useful thing to do is just read a teacher in your general tradition, but with a slightly different take. So if you've read about breath meditation from one teacher, read Shyla Catherine's Wisdom Wide and Deep and see how that lands. Read Ajahn Brahm's uh, book, uh, book on breath meditation. Read Ajahn Jeff's. Read Ajahn Suchitto's. There's all these slightly different approaches, and often you'll find that reinvigorates things. It's really good. Keep your practice vital and make that a, a priority. Take time for retreat. Talk to teachers when you need to. But keep things interesting. And that is the best way to head off a constant tendency towards proliferation. The Buddha would also praise a quality called nipapancha, which is non-proliferation. And uh, I've heard it translated by Ajahn Jeff as similar to purity of heart or singleness of purpose. And I think that speaks to something very important. In meditation, because it means that lack of proliferation doesn't mean a complete state of silence of mind, but it rather means that you have a singleness of purpose. Your mind might be playing with the meditation, mixing together ingredients, but it's staying within the realm of the four foundations of mindfulness. It's staying within the designated realm of your meditation. So it can be moving, but it has a singleness of purpose to it. But very importantly, that term can apply to a life. I remember, uh, and I've told this story before, coming to the end of college and just, I lived a good college life. I did nonprofit work, but it always felt like I was approaching the good, but at a slight angle. It never was quite enough. And because my heart didn't have a stream bed deep enough for it and a real image of transcendence and a worthy goal in life, it's as if it had no choice but to fracture itself into all these turbulent, shallower streams of Top 40 Radio, The Hunger Games, Bad Fantasy Books, watching StarCraft Online. I'm just, these are all my old vices. And they're not terrible, but the point is they cheapened my life. But until I found Dharma, there was, the heart didn't know what else to do. 
And it, that's papancha. It's the fracturing of yourself into a thousand shards. And thinking uh, and it gaining this momentum. And as your life comes in line with values you deeply believe in and a dharmic purpose, you'll find this idea of purity of heart and singleness of purpose really gain power. And there is less need for you to complicate things in your life. Simplicity gains its own nourishment or it, it becomes nutritive and it becomes enough. And the extraneous factors fall away, both in meditation and in your day-to-day -day existence and in your conversations and in everything we shed. Someone once asked Michelangelo about this beautiful sculpture he did of a horse. How did you find the horse in that stone? No, how did you turn that stone into a horse? And Michelangelo said, I didn't turn it into a horse. The horse was already there in the stone. I just chipped away everything that wasn't the horse. So as we clarify, as we simplify, as we come back to the most core storyline of our lives, which is the Four Noble Truths, to see and acknowledge our suffering, to look at its cause, to let go of that, to develop the path beyond it. It's the simplest iteration of the hero's journey I think that's ever been articulated. There's no simpler higher order pattern for life than the Four Noble Truths. So you place that as your basis, and everything that's not purity of heart falls away little by little, and the papancha does too. So I wish all of you the best on that journey. Okay, so we have some time for discussion and Q&A if people have anything they'd like to talk about. And if you're on Zoom, you can raise your Zoom hand and we can call on you as well or type it in the chat. But if you're in person, then that's great too. Um, you often say um, dedicate your practice to others, et cetera, et cetera. Um, I'm not exactly sure I understand what that means. Can you explain what that means and practically how I'm supposed to apply that? I, I'm not really making a good question here, but I don't really understand exactly what that means. That's a great question. I think a lot of people are in that boat, actually. So there's a sutta where the Buddha spoke about dedication of merit. Um, a Brahmin comes up to him and I think says, what should I do for my deceased relatives? And the Buddha says, you should dedicate goodness to them and merit. And if they're in the ghost realms, then they can receive it. And the Brahmin says, what if I have no relatives in the ghost realms? And the Buddha says, it's impossible. You've lived for so long. We all have relatives in the ghost realms. And it's this beautiful recollection, if one takes that idea of rebirth or just takes it symbolically, is that we've all been each other's mothers, daughters, brothers, sisters, um, enemies, lovers, everything. And merit means goodness. It's punya. So it's, it's happiness. It's, it's wholesome happiness and goodness. And the act of dedicating merit is recollecting it has numerous um, purposes. It's not an esoteric economy. Uh, first, it's for yourself to remember that this meditation practice isn't just for you. The world needs people with a clarity of heart. And when you let go of greed, hatred, and delusion in yourself, you, you do see the ripples out. And it is such a gem for people around you to have that in their lives. So. It's recollecting that and kind of turning our intention towards that and remembering this isn't just for us. So it has an internal benefit of keeping us from becoming too self-centered in our practice and turning those causes out. 
But the Buddha did also say that, you know, there is more than just this physicality between beings, and there is a certain resonance, and others sometimes can feel your intentions to some extent. And so a dedication of merit in that case means that uh, the Buddha spoke about beings that could sense um, you thinking of them. And if you bring someone to mind, especially someone who's passed, um, and you think about every culture except ours pretty much has a recollection of the dead, a day for it at least, so your ancestors or whatever, um, bringing them to mind and saying, I dedicate this goodness to you, what it's saying is it's inviting them to identify with your goodness and rejoice in it. And that's a brightening of their own hearts. And you kind of think about it, like if you know someone did something good and then thought of you and they, they tell you, look, I did this in your name, you know, it made me think of you, I, I did this for you, you know, in your name, it does make you feel good. So that's, that's it. That's really the simplest part. But the Buddha said there were some realms of the cosmos where that was really what people had access to. And so it's a recollection of the dead um, and of those who have passed as well. But once again, that requires a certain belief in a cosmology, which I think a lot of people aren't uh, ready to believe in. And so I think it's most readily applied as simply a way of remembering that we aren't just practicing for ourselves. So yeah, does that help? Okay. Yes, Mary, please. Whoa. Hello, everybody. I just wanted to um, talk to, just mention a little bit of this point that you made about all things converge on feeling, on Vedana. Um, and I have recently been able to put that a little bit into practice with, I've been experiencing some back pain in my body and um, usually when it comes up my my reaction had been to, you know, feel the pain, study it, um, and and all sorts of ideas about this means this and this means that, and you know the stories about how it came, the whole development story of it, and you know it was consuming. And then one day I just went, this is unpleasant. This is an unpleasant feeling, and I was amazed. The stories dropped away. It was just right here with this experience. It's just unpleasant, nothing more. So I wanted to give a shout out to that and encouragement to, to others. Thank you, Mary. I, I think you make a good point also in conversation and argument with people. Um, if you can just stop and say, ow, this really hurts. Like just come back to your own suffering. It's so disarming to the whole situation just to acknowledge suffering. So yeah, thank you for that, Mary. Thank you for the ad Hi. Um, just wanted to like see if my understanding of the first noble truth is like aligned with the talk today. I was like journaling about this yesterday as well. So I just wanted to see. Um, like the first noble truth of dukkha or like the unease, from my understanding, I feel like it's like not accepting reality for what it is like the impermanence and like the unsatisfactoriness of it. And then having an attachment to the khandas, I think that's what the five, the form, feeling, consciousness, perception, and uh, the mental formation, like having an attachment to it causes us to like move away from the, the impermanent reality that's always changing. It's causing the unease to like proliferate. I wanted to see if that, my understanding was correct or if there's like more to it. No, I think the general gist of it's correct. Um, just to really clarify that the two levels of dukkha I think is important, um, which I think are acknowledged in your question here, but that there's the dukkha of the three characteristics of anicca, anatta, dukkha. So the fact that all things are changing uh, and out of our control, et cetera, that, that dukkha is present in life regardless of our mental state. And an arahant, an enlightened being, would experience those for the remainder of their life as well. Um, that's the first arrow. But then the Buddha says we repeatedly shoot ourselves with the second arrow of dukkha, and that's the unnecessary dukkha. 
That's the dukkha of the Four Noble Truths. Um, and that's caused, that's the thing that an, an enlightened being lets go of and which we're trying to stop shooting ourselves with. And that's dukkha is caused by craving, tanha, which is the second noble truth. And um, that craving is uh, for sensual pleasure. So yeah, to kind of uh, fill up this gap of desire and discomfort by feeding off of sense pleasures, which doesn't work in the end, um, or a desire for annihilation to just blank out, or a desire to create a self to become that is somewhat uh, immortal or uh, untouchable. Um, so I think your general gist of not accepting reality as it is, it has some truth to it. Um, in the sense of this constant sense of struggle. And I really appreciate that translation of dukkha as struggle. The one caveat I'd put is that that idea of accepting reality as it is can get misused in a lot of modern Buddhist circles to say everything's fine already, you're already enlightened, just, you know, just realize it, all right? And it's, you're perfect and there's room for improvement. As I've heard like one guru say, uh, I don't know if you're perfect, but the, the point being that it's, uh, there's, um, there's work to be done. And yet that can come from a place of wholesome desire rather than hunger and thirst and struggle. So yeah, the general gist is right. Um, and uh, yeah, we just have to find a wholesome way to apply effort to let go of those causes of suffering. Yeah. Did that help at all? Yeah, it did help. Okay. Um, Quick, yeah. quick side question, which is like, for that pursuit of like non-proliferation, like that pursuit, I feel like there's always like a level of striving that comes with that as well. And is there a way to do that in a more wholesome or like less, like, like wholesome. yeah, <laughs> more wholesome way, I guess. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I mean, it's, this is sort of what I was getting at with the, that problematic and really attractive narrative of just accept things as they are. It, it, it's unbelievably prevalent in the modern spiritual landscape, and it's it's kind of a it's a problem because there is effort to be applied, and the Buddha was very clear: um, this is a practice of effort. But he talks about two kinds of effort. There's tanha, which is the basis of suffering, and that translates roughly as thirst. It's unwholesome craving. Then there's chanda, and chanda can be, it, it has some uses which are unwholesome, but it's often used in a really wholesome sense as this like wholesome zeal, enthusiasm. It has this quality of wanting to bring things to wholeness. I've often thought tanha was more aligned with the serotonin uh, circuitry to consume, uh, and Chanda was more aligned with dopamine, with it, which is like has to do with purpose. That's a, anyone who's an expert in this will definitely think I'm wrong about those things. I think, but um, so yeah, there's effort to be applied, but making sure that comes from chanda. And a huge part of our practice is we're so used to changing ourselves through tanha and self-recrimination. A big part of meditation is just refining our practice of right effort and seeing how our old patterns of like beating ourselves up or trying hard, just they just cause suffering, but that takes years to unlearn those old patterns. But chanda has a lot to do with um, creating, you know, fun replacements for old habits, uh, coming into community, creating ritual, external patterns to hold one's effort in a good way, and um, much more about creation than consumption. That's really one of the key changes, I'd say. So yeah, um, that's important. But that is what I was speaking to with learning to apply effort in meditation. Like our minds want to do stuff. We're, we're conditioned to think a lot in this culture. So instead of thinking on these weird old fantasies you've gone over again and again, which is like watching an old movie that you don't want to watch again, you wouldn't pay $5 for that. Instead, applying that mental energy to produce a mental state, to produce a new dish, it's chanda instead. It's, it's, it's like focused, wholesome effort. 
And you'll just feel the distinction between those two pathways. One leaves you feeling sticky and oily and drained. The other leaves you feeling rejuvenated and, and aligned. Um, David Stendhal Rost said, the cure to exhaustion is not rest, but wholeheartedness. So that's what we're going for. Yeah, we're not aiming, happiness is a thing to aim for, but purpose is a really powerful word. And I think that's sustaining through tragedy. Sadhu, that, that helped a lot. Thank okay. you. Cool. So I, I, did, I gave a talk a few weeks ago on dukkha, fleshing this out a bit more if people are interested. I, I guess it, it's a huge subject. One more. Oh. Okay. Uh, please, someone. Yeah. I would like to hear about your trip to China, what kind of events people you have met and what kind of insights. And another question would be about Buddhist, um, Buddhist this whole philosophy or cosmology. Is it... Um, is it this philosophy is being developed as we go in terms of new discoveries, new insights, or is it uh, fixed and um, is it observable? Is it verifiable? In some of these statements. Yeah. Okay. I got. <laughs> I got five minutes. Um, so the questions. Um, uh, can I talk about China a bit? I can. I might wait until another maybe next a Saturday or something, just so we have time to address the other questions. But it was, it was very interesting um, and beautiful. We visited some 1,700-year-old monasteries, and it felt important to have an American presence there. The tensions are really palpable. And the Chinese people, their faith is just so beautiful. And it's, it really drives home the tragedy of national discord when you see like just these really kind, loving faithful people who are caught in um, a tension with a, a country and a people that they, they don't want to be caught in it with. Um, so that was, that was a bit harrowing, actually, to see that, but beautiful to see their faith. And, and I can speak more to that as well. Um, as to the cosmology, yeah, it's funny. People, uh, what's been brought to the West mainly in terms of Buddhist thought has been the scientific elements. Um, and the parts that match with our own worldviews as dry materialist Westerners, generally. And um, that's great because the Buddha was quite unique in spiritual teachers in saying, you don't have to believe in all the other stuff to practice well. It's not a binary of belief like a lot of religions where it's like, you accept this or you don't. And based on that acceptance or not, you, you're either saved or not. You know, uh, Christ is your savior or, savior or he's not, etc. I know some Christianity holds that different, but in many cases it is a binary. But the Buddha was clear, you don't have to believe in these other things to meditate well and to purify your heart. So I think there's validity in not raising these elements up right from the get-go. But the Buddha was also clear that there, uh, in his view, there were these other realms um, of being, that physicality is not all we have. And as to that being dismissed as unscientific, or unverifiable, I think it's problematic because science is the lens. Experts form the edge of a lens through which we see the world. Most of us have not perceived atoms uh, or microbes. We rely on people with expertise and tools of, you know, microscopes to independently verify a common phenomena independently of one another. The issue in the West is that the technology of the mind has largely been lost, and that technology is samadhi. It's unification of mind. And if you look back through history and across traditions and cultures, you see people who've cultivated that unification of mind and power speaking to a pretty similar experience, and it involves something beyond the physical realm. Um, so I'd say it's sometimes worth keeping our minds open to that. And I found once I became a little more open and read some of the literature on uh, past life memories for, of children without just automatically dismissing it as fake sci science, which is what my mind did every time I heard it before I was like 19. I was like, all right, maybe I should actually read it. It was very convincing. And I started to meet a lot of people who had had experiences that I just couldn't explain. 
like my parents on a ski slope one afternoon and they're like, oh, our, our friend just died and she just died. So many people have experiences like that and yet we just dismiss them as like, who knows? So I think it's worth opening to these ideas, um, not totally closing to them. But I think it's also really important to say that the Buddha didn't say they were necessary to believe and to, to practice. And if it's just not kind of on, you know, of interest or it's off-putting, then I think it, they can really be put aside for the moment. Does that help a bit? Yeah, yeah, okay. I wish we could speak more to that, but I don't think we can because we have to wrap up. <laughs>